Hello and welcome to RC Model Reviews again. I'm in front of the whiteboard once more because I'm going to talk about something that lots of people keep asking me about. And that is 2.4 gigahertz radio installations. And who'd have thought I could write so neatly? Isn't that amazing? Anyway, installing your radio gear in a plane. I mean, it, a lot of us take it for granted, but there are actually a number of factors you have to look at. And so I'm going to give you some basics and rules of thumb to help you make a successful installation of your radio gear in your favourite plane. Right, the first thing is we need to have signal integrity. That's big words. Basically what it means is your, your aerials need to be able to work. You need to be able to receive a signal. And we've got two types of basic um, receivers these days. We have ones that have well, your servo wires out there, and then they have a little antenna. It might even have a little um, sleeve dipole on it. There's your antenna. One antenna. This is a single antenna receiver. These are a bit more critical even than the two antenna ones because this is the only way the signal's getting into your radio. So if you put this in the wrong place, you're not going to get a reliable, consistent signal, and that'll produce problems with range, lockouts, all sorts of things. So you have to be really careful. Unfortunately, it's mainly the cheaper receivers that have the single antenna, you know, the, or the, the park flyer ones that have one antenna. So, you know, it's not so bad because you're flying close with the park flyer. But uh, yeah, those ones, um, the same rules apply, but when you have a receiver that has two antennas, servo leads, some of them have two antennas, like so. This is generally for your larger models and for your longer range setups. The beauty of this is of course that you can, you've got twice the chance of catching the signal basically. And as I mentioned in one of my earlier videos on antennas, um, if we look at, if we have an antenna like this on your transmitter, and here's the antenna on your receiver, then everything is fine because the signal travels across and because these antennas basically line up, you just collect maximum amount of signal. But, as we all know, your models don't just fly vertically all the time. We like to do a bit of aerobatics, we like to turn. And when you turn your model, the antenna can be, in fact if you do a really tight turn, the antenna might even be just laying right down like this. Because the, the plane is banked right over, you bank the plane right over. In that case, the, there's no real area for the antenna to pick up the signal, so you get a very, very weak signal when your plane banks right over and the antenna is pointing straight at your transmitter. So what do you do? That's where the two antennas come in. If you've got a receiver with two antennas and the other antenna is like this, and it's still able to receive the signal because it's still lined up. You know, one banks away, the other one is coming up. So that's why you have two antennas. Well, when you've got two antennas, you put them at 90 degrees. This angle here, 90 degrees. So that there's, there's never a situation where both antennas are pointed directly at your transmitter. Very important. That is essential to get maximum reliability and range. These, of course, the single antenna receiver, well, you're pretty stuffed. You, there's gonna be points where the antenna is pointing straight at your transmitter, so hopefully you've still got enough signal strength. That's, you know, I've never had a real problem. I think the Turnergy receiver's got the single antenna. A lot of the free sky, the little four channel free skies have one antenna. They all work fine. They won't give you as much range when you've got the situation where the antennas pointing straight at the transmitter, but there's enough headroom in most of these radios these days to allow for that. So you might lose a, you might be a momentary period where the receiver doesn't pick up the transmitter, but you don't notice it because you're not wiggling the sticks all the time. It'll just continue flying. You won't even notice what is actually a momentary lockout. Okay, so that's your signal integrity, which is basically the mounting of your antennas. And they should, remember the big thing, 90 degrees. Very important that they're 90 degrees apart. Now that 90 degrees can be, let me just go back over here, you know, because 90 degrees can be lots of things, can't it? Let's have a look at the front of our, here's our plane. Here it is. Beautiful model. It's a tea tail. There's, that. there's the front of our plane. Now, if you're going to mount your antennas at 90 degrees, let me use a different coloured pen for this, you could have one going straight up and one going out like that. So, still 90 degrees, piece of cake. Or, you could have both of them at 45 degrees, like this. Still 90 degrees between them. So yeah, it doesn't really matter, to be totally honest. But there is another issue, because um, 90 degrees can go the other way as well. Let's have a look at the, the plan form of our plane. Here we go, there's our tail. There's the thing, here's our wing. And here's the front with our propeller. Now, 
should your antennas be set up this way. Let's assume you have one going vertical there. Does the one that's at 90 degrees, should you lay it out that way or that way? Does it matter? Well, no, it doesn't really matter at all, actually. It's, gonna, it's not going to matter. So you could have one vertical and one pointing towards the tail, one vertical, one pointing towards the wing. Wouldn't really matter. As long as you've got them well clear of stuff, because one of the key things, one of the things that can kill your signal strength that your receiver is getting is if here's your antenna, let's say that's your antenna, going off to your receiver, and here's your battery, and your transmitter is over here. Ooh, batteries absorb a lot of signal. So if you've got your antenna right close to the battery, you may find there are times when, hey, there's no signal. You can pick this up, of course, in a range test. You've always got to do a range test when you've installed the gear in a new model. Don't rely on the fact that, hey, it worked in the last model, or that, you know, no, no problems, because there may be an issue you're not aware of. It may be that in the installation you've just done, the battery or something else is blocking the signal in certain angles. You won't notice it until you go to do a turn, perhaps, and then suddenly, no control. The other thing you've got to avoid is when you have your receiver, like so, with its antenna, We'll assume there's one in this case, could be two. You don't want these servo leads running around here right next to the antenna. If this distance here is less than about two inches, or that's 54, what is it, 58 millimeters in the millimeters. If that distance is too close, if your antenna is too close to your servo wires or any wires, give me the battery wires, the wires to the ESC, then you're going to make that antenna operate less efficiently. It'll still work, you'll still be able to control, but the range could be significantly reduced and that's not good. So again, you may be flying around, you go a little bit further than you did yesterday and it's all over, no more signal. So you've got to keep a spacing between the different bits of wiring between the antenna and the other wires. So we need 90 degrees between the antennas. Spacing from wiring. And in fact, spacing from anything metal. It could be your undercarriage. Don't run your antenna and tape it to your nose leg. That's not going to work at all. Because anything metal will be absorbing the signal that should be going to your antenna. So whether that's the copper wire in your servo leads, or whether it's your um, a carbon fiber wing, wing tube, or maybe it's a, a nose leg, all those things, if they're too close, they suck the signal away from your antenna, reduce your range. They've got to keep those antennas well out and free and clear on their own. And a lot of my models, People look at them and I've got antennas poking up the wind. Just like in the old days, the 72 megs, I just poke the little antenna up, maybe through the side of the fuselage, pokes out in the air. Because if it's poking out in midair, it's not near anything and it gives you a better result. So those are important things. And really, if you, if you look at these two basic things here, these are the things that will ensure that your receiver is able to get a good signal. But getting a good signal isn't the only thing. You need to make sure that your receiver is getting good power from the battery, from the BEC, from whatever you're using to power it. And of course, we know that these days there are more and more models with more and more servos and, you know, they're more powerful servos. And generally speaking, the, the way we have on electric models anyway is we have our LiPo and that goes through, we have an ESC here and that goes off to drive the motor. <clears throat> and out of there comes a signal that goes off to our receiver. That's the, here's our antenna. This is the throttle. And it also delivers power. It also delivers power to the receiver. Because inside the ESC there is a BEC. Let's just do that so you know there's power going there. There's a BEC inside the ESC. The problem is that as you add more and more servos to your, let's do some servos over here. As you add more and more servos to your receiver, they start to draw more and more current, more and more energy. And the beck in here can only provide so much power. And if you exceed the power that the beck can deliver, then all sorts of bad things happen. The voltage here goes down and we've all heard of brownouts. That's what happens when the voltage going into the receiver is not high enough for the receiver to function. So it just shuts down and then it has to reboot. And that can take, in some cases like with Spectrum, you know, at one stage you could take, you know, five, ten seconds to reboot. Long, long time. During that time you've got no control, your plane's flying on its own. So this situation is fine, having the onboard ES, uh, onboard BEC is fine for small models, little foamies and things, but when you get into bigger models, for example the Taft Hobby Viper jet there, that has a separate UBEC, 
because you couldn't build one into an ESC that would do the job. So you have a separate one, in which case we have from the LiPo, we have UBEC, which is just a fancy name for a voltage regulator. And that then goes off to the receiver. So this takes the LiPo voltage, which might be 22 volts in the case of a six cell, and then puts out five volts to power your receiver. And it can handle several amps. These are usually only two or three amps maximum if they're built into a ESC. If you have a separate one, then you can draw eight amps, 10 amps, you know, just choose the UBEC to suit. So you can power many, many more servos without having to worry about the uh, receiver shutting down due to low voltage. That's really important. So you need to make sure you've got a really consistent Viable source of power. And if worst comes to worst, I mean, I've done this myself and it's not a bad strategy. You can have a separate battery to power your radio gear, just like you did in the days of Nitro, and you'd put on a glider. Have a separate battery that does nothing but power the receiver and the servos. And then, doesn't matter what happens over here, your receiver is always going to have a nice fresh supply of power, so it will always be listening through the antennas and receiving the signal and making the servos move. It's pretty important. So there you go, that's basically it. Now, there, were some, there are some other aspects which really don't apply that much anymore and that is protection. In the old days with 72 megahertz radios we used to have to wrap our receivers up in foam because they were delicate little things they had crystals and coils and things that if you gave them a good bang bits would break and you couldn't use them anymore. These days the 2.4 gig gear stuff is it's just so solid it's done with surface mount technology which means there's nothing hanging out in the breeze to wobble or shake and they'll take an enormous amount of punishment so most people don't actually wrap them in foam just velcro them to the side of the model and also if you have a really bad crash just throw them away because they're now so cheap you know that you can afford to replace them if in doubt and the other thing of course i couldn't go by without mentioning is fail safe and this is something that's so often overlooked by people when they do an installation. Now most good, I say good sets of radio gear have programmable fail safe. And what that means is should something go wrong, should we have a mess up in our aerials, don't get a signal, should something fail so there's no signal getting to the receiver, the fail safe will kick in and you can have it so that it drives the servos to predefined positions. For example, a lot of my fail safe, what I do is I set it up so that if I lose the radio signal, it goes up elevator and some aileron. So if I'm flying along and for whatever reason the signal disappears, I can immediately see that something's wrong because the model will pitch up and roll. And if I don't recover control, it will then go into a tight spiral and crash into the ground. It won't fly off into the distance. It won't fly far enough to hit anybody. It'll just basically corkscrew itself into the ground because I'd rather have a broken model than injure somebody. And that's the way I prefer to do it with failsafe. Some people uh, prefer just to have what they call last position hold. So if you're flying along and you lose the signal, the servos will stay where they were. Now that could mean your motor keeps going, it keeps flying straight and level for who knows how long. And the idea behind that is that most interruptions to signal are relatively short. So if you're flying along and you have a, a loss of signal for say two or three seconds, you might not even notice it because the model will just keep flying. And if you haven't put any inputs in, it'll just appear as if nothing's wrong. I don't like that situation because I like to know if my model has stopped receiving the signal. And with the kick up, with the up elevator and aileron, you'll know immediately that the signal is no longer valid because the model will suddenly twitch and it'll think, you'll think, oh, I better land this because something is not right. So even when you do get control back, if you get control back, you'll be aware and you'll be able to bring it in and land it before something bad happens. And that's a part of safety. So fail safe. As I say, most good 2.4 gig systems have it. If yours has it, use it. The Turnergy, the inbuilt Turnergy radio system doesn't have fail safe. All it does is if you run out of signal, it stops sending signals to the throttle control, I think maybe also to the servo. So it all goes limp and it, basically the motor will stop and the plane will just glide down and who knows where it'll land. Um, you, but you can't program the positions of the servos. The free, all the FreeSky receivers have programmable fail safe. I think Futaba has programmable file safe. Some Spectrum receivers do, some don't, just depends on whatever. Um, so yeah, it's just, you have to look at the manual in your radio gear and see whether yours does or not. But if it does have it, then use it, especially on larger models. I know my gas model, I have it programmed for a flex, a snap roll. And so there's no, no hoping the signal will come back. If I've lost the signal, I don't want that plane in the air any longer. And because I always fly over an area where if I was to crash, I'm not gonna cause any problems. It's over a grassy paddock or over a runway, not over buildings or people. If something goes wrong, it's gonna pile drive itself into the ground in a safe area, rather than fly around for a couple of minutes in big circles until a motor conks out and then crash into a house. So those are things you have gotta consider. Remember, your, your model is replaceable. People and BMWs are not, unless you earn a lot of money.
So that's the secret to fail safe use. Even on the small models, even on little foamies, I use it because if you have that thing where it, it kicks the elevator up as soon as you lose the signal, you know there's something wrong. Even if you know it's uh, it's a tiny model, it's not worth saving. You want to know. You want to know that suddenly the signal's gone. So do it. Fail safe. Use it. Don't. Oh, I'll do it later. Once you've set your model up, get your set, position set up, activate your fail safe before the test flight. Because if you've got problems with your installation, they're probably going to show up in the test flight anyway. And if, you lose, if the signal's coming and going and you haven't set your fail safe up, you may not realise it because the model's just flying along as normal, everything's staying in position it was. But if it starts kicking and bucking, you know, ooh, something wrong with my installation and I'd better fix it. So there you go. It's the basics of installations. I'll show you some of my installations. These aren't the best, of course, because one of the problems you've got, and I've discussed these issues, is this is in an ideal world, but sometimes a lot of the models now are very small. You know, getting this two inch separation between your antennas and the other wiring, sometimes it's just not possible. You know, in a tiny model, there's just not enough room to move your antennas that far away. And so you've got to make compromises. So I'll show you a couple of my planes and the compromises, compromises I've had to make, but they still fly perfectly fine. First up, let's take a look at my AXN. Now everybody's got an AXN and you'll be able to see what I've done here. I've got the little FreeSky receiver. That's a four channel one. It's the full range one with the two antennas. Nice receiver. It's got telemetry. Brilliant receiver. It's one of my favorite receivers for small models because it's got all the range. It's got the telemetry to warn you if you're having problems. And it's so small and light that it's easy to install. It also has the antennas, the long antennas. So I can actually move my antennas right out here. For example, this one comes out and I've got it under the wing. It's a bit hard to see here, I'll tip it over. So you can see I've run it out the side of the fuselage and then along the front of the wing so it's horizontal. When the model's normally flying along at normal attitude, this antenna is horizontal. And then of course I need one at 90 degrees so I've run the other antenna here through the side of the fuselage, if I can get it around so you can see, Let's have a look, through the side of the fuselage and it runs down the side. I've just taped it to the side so it's running vertical. So most of the time this antenna is going to be doing the work because the plane is flying level and my transmitter antenna is vertical but when I bank steeply as you might do, oh it's a bit hard here, I'm in a bit tight on the camera. So when I bank steeply into like a really tight turn this antenna becomes vertical and that starts doing all the hard work. So that's really simple. Now I'm using the standard ESC or the one that I prefer to use it. Uh, Hobby King ESC and that's got more than enough power to drive the servos that it, this model has so I don't have to worry about power, the power is just fine. Um, the fact that these antennas are floating around inside doesn't matter because this has got a coaxial cable, there's this little screen on this wire so it's not going to pick up any noise from in here, it's only the active ends of the antennas that actually pick up the signal. So these are great, you can get the aerials right out of the way and get them where they can get a nice clean signal. Uh, perhaps the only thing wrong with this installation is that this side antenna here is a little bit close to the battery. So we've only got an inch or so between that antenna and the battery but as I say it still works just fine and dandy so that's, that's a successful installation. I've flown this thing to quite long distances, I can't tell you how far. Now here's my Hobby King DLG and again this is a really tight install. You don't have much room in here, it's a really, I'll just move this pad out of the way so I can get a bit of contrast against the desk, it's a really um, small pod, not much room to put radio gear in there so keeping the antenna away is difficult and also it's one of the four channel uh, non-diversity receivers from FreeSky, again great little thing, they claim a kilometre of range and I'd believe it actually, I've flown these things to the limited visual range, no problems, but they've got this antenna here, what are you going to do with it? We want to keep it away from this other wiring of course as I said, but there's no way we're going to get uh, 50 millimetres of separation between these wires and that antenna. So we just do the best we can and as I hope you can see here um, I've just curled, curled the wire up so it's heading away from these wires and once I've plugged it in I tuck these wires down there and so I've got maximum separation that's all I can do but hey I've spec'd this out no problems at all with range so there's a lot of headroom in this modern radio gear even an imperfect installation can work quite well and you know so you and when I range tested it, it tested fine, so I was quite confident flying it, and it's, it's worked out really well. As for power, well, in this one, I probably can't see, but I've got a two cell LiPo in there, 180 millimeters, and a tiny little u bit down the side here, and that helps bring the center of gravity forward. It was a little bit tail heavy when I tried it with a single cell, and that u bit there is good for two and a half amps. Now it's only got two servos, never gonna draw two and a half amps, so plenty of headroom in the power department and that's proven through the flight performance and the, the long range and, and actually I get a lot of time out of this little battery as well so 
there you go. Another install that would otherwise be rather difficult, uh, made easy by some common, th common sense thinking and just doing the best you can. Now look at my little Sky Angel F16. I love this little plane. It's given me a lot of pleasure and I've retrofitted it with the, the metal EDF so it's still going. Um, in here, again, not a lot of room in a model this size. So what I've done is I've got one of the little Free Sky 4 channel receivers and I've actually just wedged it against the side. You can see the wiring in here and I've used just a piece of EPP just to wedge it against the side like so, which keeps this wiring out of the way. And then the antenna, I've just poked it out the side. That's all I've done, just curled it around out the side. Again, keeping it as far away from this wiring as possible and as far away from the battery which fits up here as possible. So even in this model, I've actually achieved, almost virtually achieved the, the big spacings I wanted to give this antenna the best opportunity. Now, when I get the lid on, this antenna sits pretty much horizontal, so it's not the best, but again, it's never had a problem. You don't fly a model like this too far away because it's so small. And even though the antenna is not in the optimal position or at the optimal angle, it still works just fine because we've got that headroom I was speaking of. So yeah, it's, uh, you do what you can with the space you've got. And unless you do something really wrong, for example, the worst thing I could have done with this is to think, oh, that looks untidy. Let's just put that down there like that. And tried to fly it like that. That would be courting disaster because these wires here are going to suck away the signal that should be going to that little antenna. So get that antenna out in the clear where it's not going to be affected by the wiring and make sure it stays that way. A little bit of foam and it's all good. So I hope that's explained some of the basics for you. You know, the things to watch out for, the things to try and avoid when you're installing your 2.4 gig gear and let me say it one more time because it's so important do a range test most of this modern radio gear has got a little button you push it and it cuts the range right down you do your 30 40 paces whatever and walk around the model don't just walk away from it but walk around it so you can be sure that it's getting the signal from all angles and if it passes the range test then hey you're pretty much good to go and if you've got the fail safe set should something go wrong then at least you won't risk injuring people um, although you know the model it's another story. So thank you for watching. If you've got any questions, if I've missed anything, then please leave them in the comments section on this video. If you've got any comments, leave them there too. If you like the video, if you think it's going to help people, then give it a thumbs up so other people can find it. Stay tuned. Some more of the basics videos coming from RC Model Reviews really soon.